Good evening, my brother. Good evening. Thank you for joining tonight. Am I coming across good? Praise the Lord. We're going to get started in a few minutes. Maybe a minute. Maybe one minute or two. Well, amen, amen, amen. It's Tuesday again. The Lord has blessed us to be here one more time to be able to share the word of God again. I'm excited about what God is doing through these lessons. All week long, God has been dealing with me concerning sealing the breaches in my life. And I'm so awe, so so in awe of his presence. How when God begins to speak to us concerning our own personal lives, to perfect the thing that concerns us and to change our lives for the better. It is so vital for us to pay attention and to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit and allow him to do his work in our lives. I heard a message today about FU and it's by Dr. Matthew Stevenson. And he was talking about forgive, forgive you, forgive you. In other words, you got to learn how to forgive yourself as well as forgive other people who have wronged you and have hurt you, have scarred you, have messed you up throughout your life. And you have to know to move forward. You got to be willing to let it go. And that is so awesome to know that Christ paid the price, the atoning sacrifice for our sins and our iniquities. And he forgave us for all the things that we have done to break the heart of God. And it's so amazing to know that the same way we can reciprocate that same love to someone else who is living in a sin and iniquity in the world today. So we're going to go into a word of prayer. Gracious God, our Father, I thank you for another opportunity, O oh God, to share your word tonight. I pray, Lord God, that the spirit of the living God will speak to our hearts by divine revelation. That you, Lord God, would challenge, provoke, change, convict, reprove, sanctify. Fill us with your spirit tonight, O oh God, that we'll have you moving in our hearts, Father God, to the full capacity to bring our lives to the, to the obedience unto Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and no longer repel, resist, or oppose you, Lord God, but we humble ourselves 
before the mighty hand of God that you will be glorified in the midst. Have your God like way on tonight, O oh God. Allow the word of God to speak to our hearts, O oh God, to help us grow in grace and in the knowledge of who you are. And I thank you that we walk by faith and not by sight and that we're able to live and abide in the victory that's already been won through Jesus Christ our Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. God is good. His mercy endures forever. The Bible tells us, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. And we come to praise the Lord, even in our studying tonight, to give him the acclimates that do his name, because he is worthy to be praised. He is highly exalted. He reigns forevermore. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Last week we talked about, began talking about the wilderness ment mentalities, how there are many different types of mentalities that people have in the body of Christ, and many times we hinder ourselves from progressing in the will and the plan that God has for our life because of disobedience and because of the mindset that's of the world and not of Christ. And God wants us to know tonight that, hey, you can change your thought life. You can change your attitude. You can change your character tonight by learning how to yield, surrender, and release yourself into the will and the obedience of the Holy Spirit. Set your mind and keep it set on the Lord and on the things that are above and not on the earth. Colossians chapter 3 verse 2 says, And set your minds and keep them set on what is above the higher things and not the things that are on the earth. And that is so important as a believer, as a child of God, to change your focus. Many believers in the body of Christ have a carnal, car, car, carnality in their mentality. And what I mean by that, you still have worldly thoughts. You still have the worldly influences controlling your mindset instead of the Holy Spirit. You're dominated by the mind of the flesh instead of the mind of the spirit. So the word tells us, Paul was talking to the church at Colossae. He says, you need to change your focus. Set your mind on things that are above and not on things that are of the earth. And when you have your mind set on the things above and not on the earth, guess what? Your life becomes more freer, becomes more fruitful, more bonded, becomes prosperous. And the spirit of the living God will begin to change your thought life to cause you to gravitate to things that will produce the blessings and the favor and the promises of God in your life. You know, but the thing is, a lot of times we get caught up in the things of the world because we feed our flesh with more things of the world than of the things of God. God has spoke to me a while ago about incorporating into my daily activity, listen to more sermons, read more scriptures, get more things into my spirit where my spirit man can grow and not the mind of the flesh where the flesh keep the, the spirit under suppression. And that's what the enemy wants to do in your life is suppress the spirit of the living God that's inside of you to keep you living a defeated and a, 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 a doubtful life contrary to the mind of Christ and to, and to speak against the word of God. But tonight we're going to engage in the word of God in chapter 16, part three of the wilderness mentality. And we're going to see what God has spoken to us even more to challenge us in our thought life to change. Too many people in the body of Christ are bound with the mind of the world, and they find themselves with a life of failure, a life of bondage, an imprisonment in themselves, even with unforgiveness, with bitterness and hatred, resentment, all these different characteristics of the enemy has controlled their lifestyles to where they cannot even be free if they want to be free. So tonight we're going to go into chapter 16, my future is determined by my past and my present. My future is determined by my past and my present. 
when there is no vision. Proverbs, turn up Proverbs 29, chapter, verse 18. Proverbs 29, chapter, verse 18. And it says this, I'm going to read it in the New Living Translation as well as in the um, Amplified and the King James. In the King James, it says, where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Where there is no vision, no foresight, no plan for the future, can't see what God sees. You're blinded from success in the things of God. The people perish. And what he's talking about, if you don't have the word of God as your foundation and your focus in your life, you have no vision. The greatest eyesight we should have in the kingdom of God is to have our eyes set on Jesus Christ for him to begin to fill our lives with the purpose, the plan, and the will that God has for our lives. The New Living Translation says it like this. When people do not accept divine guidance, they will run wild. But whoever obeys the law is joyful. When people do not accept divine guidance, they run wild. And what is happening as a child of God, if you're not heeding to the instructions of the Holy Spirit and the leadership from the Word of God to direct your steps and the plan that God has for your life, you're going to run wild. You're going to do whatever you want to do to make your flesh happy. So you find yourself gravitating to things that puffs up the flesh and suppresses the Spirit of the living God instead of raising the Spirit of God inside you to give you foresight, give you knowledge, give you understanding, give you wisdom. You'll find yourself suppressing the Spirit of God, grieving the Holy Spirit inside of you. And the flesh begins to dominate your lifestyle, your mindset, and control your thought life. The Amplified says it like this. It says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Where there's no vision, the people perish. The Israelites had no positive vision for their lives, no dreams. They knew they came from, they knew where they came from, but did not know where they were going. Everything was based on what they had, had seen and could see. They did not know how to see with the eye of faith. Hebrews 11, chapter, verse 1 said, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Why? Because when I set my sight on the things that God wants me to see, to gravitate to in my life, it's going to give me foresight for the vision God has for me. I begin to have the dreams that will line up with my purpose that God has for me. A lot of times when we have visions, and the vision are of God, the vision of something that's going to validate the call and the purpose that God has on your life. But the enemy comes along to pervert your vision. He distort your vision with the things of the flesh, the things of the world, to distract you from seeing what God sees and, and begin to perceive what God wants you to perceive in your heart. So the children of Israel, just like the church today, many people, they go to church out of routine, and you go to church without a purpose, without a vision. So every time the Lord is trying to speak to you to give you divine revelation, you can't perceive it because you're blinded from the truth by the enemy. Everything was based on what they could see and what they had seen. You have a lot of people are stuck in the mentality of the world Seeing things of the flesh that gravitates the flesh instead of the things of the spirit. And we have to allow the spirit of God to remove the scales from our eyes. That we can see what God sees, hear what God hears, walk in the plan and the purpose that he has for our lives. 
St. Luke chapter 4. St. Luke chapter 4. Let's go there. St. Luke chapter 4. And verse 18. It says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captive, and recovery in sight to the blind, and to set at liberty them that are bruised. The anointing that God has placed in your life, it has such a capacity of power. And the very things that I mentioned here, when the Spirit of the Lord comes upon your life, he empowers you to walk in your purpose. Not only that, he's, he anoints you with the presence of the Lord where you can preach the gospel. And the Bible tells us that every born-again believer is enabled to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we have been called by God to preach the gospel. But a lot of people are in a position where they're not studying the word of God, they're not meditating on the word of God, they're not proclaiming the word of God over themselves or over their family. But the Bible tells us that we have an anointing. That we have an anointing on our lives, the purpose of the anointing is to preach the gospel to the poor. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. When you preach the gospel to the poor, it changes their perspective about themselves, where they begin to see themselves in the viewpoint of the way God sees them, prosperous. The Bible tells them, let the poor say I'm rich in Christ Jesus. God has the ability to allow the anointing to change your situation in your life. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted and to preach deliverance to the captive and to recover the sight of the blind. So many people that are blind by truth, God says, we have the ability, we have the word of God, we have the power, we have the anointing to proclaim the truth and set the people free who are blinded. But if you can't, you cannot help no one else if you can't help yourself. And that's a very important point as a child of God. You got to be able to help yourself by staying in the Word of God, studying the Word of God, meditating on the Word of God, keeping the Word in your heart and in your mouth to speak that Word over yourself. So no matter what the enemy says to you, He's not going to negate the word of God in your life. So, I come from a background of abuse. We read this last week. I'm going to read a part of it again, then I'm going to jump ahead. So, I come from a background of abuse. I was raised in a dysfunctional home. My childhood was filled with fear and torment. The experts say that, that a child's personality, <coughs> excuse me, it's fought within the first five years of his life. My personality was a mess. I lived in a pretense behind the walls of protection that I had built to keep people from hurting me. And so many people in the body of Christ are in the same type of mindset where they're scarred by their past. They're scarred by their upbringing. They're scarred by their life. And God wants, to know, wants you to know tonight that he can change your past and allow you to not be scarred or stuck in the past, but to learn from the past and proceed into the future he has for your life. I felt that my future will always be marred by my past. So many people feel that way in the body of Christ. They feel like their, their mistakes, their upbringing, the things that happened to them as a child, that scarred their heart, that broke their heart, messed their minds up, it's the way that future will always be. The devil is a lie. Because if Jesus has redeemed us from the curse of Lord's sin and death, guess what? He healed you from your past. 
the things that happened to you, the things that broke you, the things that tried to kill you, are the very things that God uses to perfect you. But you have to be willing to allow the spirit of the living God to perfect the thing that concerns your life. There are things that come forth from the rod. Out of, it says, there, and there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse. A branch shall grow out of his roots. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and the spirit of might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he shall make him quick of understanding. In the fear of the Lord, he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after, after the hearing of his ears. This talking about Christ. Isaiah was prophesying of the Messiah to come. And he said, this is what the, the Messiah is going to be like when he comes. The spirit of the living God is going to rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom. So he's going to know how to deal with people. He's going to know how to judge people. He's going to know how to judge righteously. Understanding. The spirit of counsel. The spirit of knowledge. So he's going to get everything he needs from the Father in heaven to be instilled in his heart on how to deal with all types of people, even how to make decisions that are of godly principles from the word of God and judge people righteously. Then he says he will have the fear of the Lord. We have the same anointing in our lives today. And the spirit of the living God is the same power that has equipped us with the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of counsel, quick understanding, you know one thing about God? God is so unique. Because when you study God's word, and you get his word in your spirit, that word is going to ring in your heart constantly. Even when it comes to being faced with opposing forces through other people, even when it comes to making decisions, the word that you have planted in your heart that have been sown on good ground will begin to manifest in your hearing, in your spirit. And your heart will begin to receive the right word of what to speak at the right time, at the right moment. Not only that, it will cause you to judge things according to the standards of the Holy Spirit in your life. So we got to allow the word of God to get in our hearts. So we cannot judge things accurately by the sight of our natural eye. We must have the spiritual eye to see and ears to hear. We need to hear what the Spirit says and not what the world says. So we got to stay in the word of God in order to have sound decisions and making the right decisions in life, even the right choices in life, is governed by the spirit of living God. What is the problem? All Israelites grumbled and deplored their situation, accusing Moses and Aaron, to whom the whole congregation said, we would have died, we would have had died in Egypt, or, or that we died in the wilderness. Why does the Lord bring us to this land to fall by the sword? Our wives, our little ones, will be a, be a prey. It is better for us to return to Egypt. So the children of Israel, in Numbers chapter 14, verse 2 and 3, they complained about God's deliverance, of bringing them from slavery under the leadership of Pharaoh and the bondage of sin to, to the wilderness in the progress to take them to their land that he has for them. But the thing was, they grumbled, they complained, they always had a problem with leadership. There are so many people in the body of Christ today have issues with leadership in the body of Christ. And one thing about it, it doesn't matter who the leader is, the problem is really not with the leader. It's about your heart not willing to submit to leadership. And when God reveals to you your heart, your heart condition, your heart's problems, your heart situation, we need to get to the place where we recognize what the Spirit of God is saying about our heart and allow him to cleanse our hearts, to change our thinking and change our mindset and change our attitude that we learn how to be obedient and submit to authority and walk in truth and righteousness. I encourage you to look over this passage carefully. Notice how negative people were 
complaining, ready to give up easily, preferring to go back to bondage rather than press through the wilderness into the promised land. That's the very same thing that happens today. When things get difficult, things get challenging in our lives, we're quick to give up. We're quick to remind ourselves it was better when I was out there living in the world, drinking and clubbing and thugging and all those different things than it is now living for Christ. It was, it was easier when I was a drug addict or a prostitute or a liar or a thief than when I came to Christ. It seemed like everything got worse the moment I gave my life to Christ. You know what that is? That's deception. There's a lie from the enemy. And the enemy wants you to think that it's okay to have the mind of the world to keep reverting back to the things where they used to be. In other words, get stuck in the rut of the past instead of progressing into the promises that are in Christ Jesus. We miss the promises because we allow ourselves to speak ourselves out of the will of God. And when I speak myself out of the will of God, I cannot see what God sees. I cannot hear what God hears. I will not do what God wants me to do because I'm stuck. It's like being in quicksand. I love the old Western movies, especially uh, 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 the, the Lone Ranger. I remember one of those episodes where they were going against this one enemy and one of the people fell into some quicksand. They had to save the person. Matter of fact, the Lone Ranger, he slipped onto the quicksand. And they had to use silver to pull him out of the quicksand, which was his horse. And we, get, we do the same thing. We get our focus off of God, and we look at things around us and begin to sink into the quicksand of life. So the world begin to suck out the life inside of you and cause you to sink deeper and deeper to depression, to misery, to, to anger, malice, all kinds of stuff the world offers to pull me from my focus. We got to keep a stern focus on what God has for us. If you can't see what God sees, you'll always find yourself reverting backwards to the things that kept you in bondage and in spiritual imprisonment in the wilderness instead of coming out of the wilderness and going to the promised land that God has for you. Actually, they did not have a problem. They were the problem. They did not have a problem. They were the problem. How many times have you examined your heart and found out you were blaming everybody else for a problem or an issue when you were the problem? When God reveals to us ourselves, we don't like it. We don't want to hear it. We turn a deaf ear because it's going to hurt. It's going to bring conviction. It's going to force me to have to change what I'm doing, to stop doing things I'm doing, to live the life that Christ has for me and come out of the world, but because I'm comfortable, I find it easy to get stuck in the wilderness of my mind. So the wilderness mentality tells me I'll never measure up to God's standards. I'll never live right. I'll always keep making the same mistakes. How come God always blessed everybody else and seemed like he passed me by? We'll always find ourselves in the mindset of excuses. If they hadn't got in my way when I was trying to start this business, I would be successful today. If they had to help me when I wanted to go to college, but I couldn't afford to go to college, so I didn't go. So it was everybody else's fault for my accomplishments meant failing in my life. Instead of looking at myself, how I hindered and limited myself from progressing. And when God begins to show you your heart, we, we kick, we fight against, we cry, we, we, we get into a pity party. We find ourselves slipping backwards into the pitfall of life and never see ourselves being successful. There are people that have been in church. For 30, 40, 50, 
60 years and never made anything out of their lives, but would live their life passively and live their lives in regret of what they shoulda, coulda, woulda, and never got became to a place of success in their own life. And many died with their dreams. Many died with their visions because they never saw themselves in the ability to accomplish what God says they can do. Bad thoughts produce bad attitudes. Bad thoughts produce bad attitudes. Now there was no water for the congregation and they assembled together against Moses and Aaron. And the people contended with Moses and said, would that we have died when our brothers died in the plague before the Lord? And why have you brought us up the congregation of the Lord into this wilderness? That we should die here? We and our livestock? In Numbers chapter 20, verse 2 through 4, is what that's talking about. How the people were thirsty. The cattle were thirsty. And they were complaining and murmuring against Moses and Aaron that you brought us out here to die. We had it better in Egypt. Things were better for us because we had what we needed. We had water when we needed it. But now we're out here about to die of thirst. So they complained. They mumbled. They grumbled. They got into a nasty attitude to where their attitude produced bad thoughts. And the bad thoughts came from the bad attitude. And the way they were thinking was a defeated mentality of not seeing themselves being able to be supplied by Jehovah God who was leading them in the wilderness. So instead of seeing themselves progressing, they found themselves degressing in attitude. It is easy to see from their own words that the Israelites were not trusting God at all. They had a negative failure attitude. They decided they would fail before they ever really even got started. Simply because every circumstance was not perfect. Simply because every circumstance was not perfect. They display an attitude that came from wrong mindset. Isn't that something? How we do the same thing today in the body of Christ? We have such a bad attitude we have a, a bad motive, bad intentions, bad thoughts. So everything about us attract negative stuff. We talked about this in our previous lessons, how negative people attract negative people. Negative conversation will open up the gateway and the portals of hell to release more demons into your life of negativity. And they will come through other people that are not walking in the plan, in the will, in the purpose of God. Even believers who have abandoned their faith become very negative. Because you open up the gateway for the enemy coming to your life and feed you with all the delicacies of negativity. And so you begin to feed on negativity to your life becomes your own destructive mechanism. You destroy yourself by your attitude. Bad attitudes are the fruit of bad thoughts. Bad attitudes are the fruit of bad thoughts. A lack of attitude, it says a lack of an attitude of gratitude, a lack of an attitude of gratitude. And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around to the land of Edom and because they became impatient, depressed, much discouraged because of the trials of the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and we loathe this light, contemptible, unsubstantial manner. See, what happened is God began to feed the children of Israel manna, and they still grumble and complain. And the thing is about God, it doesn't matter what you need. It's the attitude of how you present yourself before God for your need. And a lot of people come to God 
with such a bitter and a, a prideful attitude and a haughtiness in their attitude, expecting God to give them what they want right now. Sometimes God, when he sees your attitude, is not an attitude of gratitude. He will allow the enemy to prolong your blessing. He will allow the enemy to get in the, in the way of your blessing to distract you and distort you from receiving what God has for you. And it's so important to recognize my attitude. If my attitude is not glorifying God, I need to check my attitude before I wreck myself. Because a lot of times when my attitude is not right with God, it won't be right with nothing else in life. I'll take a negative attitude to work, take a negative, negative attitude to church, take a negative attitude to the store, take a negative attitude to the gas stations. My attitude will be so warped and messed up that everywhere I go, I take the attitude with me. It's like carrying my wallet. I love the commercial uh, um, uh, Capital One, what's in your wallet? Because it makes you think if you have the Capital One card, you have something of value that you're going to hold on to. You're going to carry your wallet everywhere you go. The same way it is in the spirit. What's in your spiritual wallet? Is your attitude the attitude of Christ or your attitude is of the world, the devil himself? And a lot of times we carry these different types of attitudes and we attract negative people to us and we wonder why people always always come around grumbling and complaining. Because you open the door to invite the enemy coming to your heart through a breach, and that breach gave him access to warp your attitude. So when your attitude is messed up, now you're off track, you're on the pathway of destruction, you know, left truth and righteousness, and you fall after a lie. As a matter of fact, you're seeking doctrines to appease your flesh. All this stems from a thought. What is your thought life? What is your heart meter telling you today? Is your heart meter connected with the spirit of the living God, where the, the rates are going higher and higher in this presence? Or is your meter on the down low? to where the enemy's sucking the life out of you and your attitude is becoming conducive to the worldly attitude with bitterness and hatred and anger and unforgiveness, malice and jealousy, all this stuff. When God is trying to get your attention, hey, that's not the mind of Christ. Philippians 2 and 5 says, let this mind be in you, that's also in Christ Jesus. When you let the attitude of Christ be inside of you, his attitude is of peace, of love, of joy, Righteousness, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, forbearance, temperance. His attitude will attract positive people into my life to feed me with the word of God, to encourage me that I can accomplish what my dream, my visions are. People to motivate me. He, he has called me to be attracted to the things that are of the kingdom of God to help build my faith and not tear my faith down. If you don't have self-discipline, you'll always find yourself stuck in the mindset of the world. And when God is trying to get you to a higher place in him, there's so much distractions that it's blinding you when you can't even see past the fog in your eyes. Many people in the body of Christ have a spiritual fog right before their faces. And you can't even see past a thick fog because you allow the enemy to cloud you with this smoke, to blind you from truth. And therefore, if the gospel is hid, it's hid to them who are lost, whom the God's word blind the minds of them. So the enemy blinds you by clouding your vision. Then he gives you, gets you to a place where you have no power to fight. He done stole your strength. He done took your joy. He took every attribute and characteristic of Christ and gave you all the old stuff, the junk that was of the old nature, to resurrect it back to life again. To now you're trying to live and mimic the things you used to do. I've seen so many grown men recently still walking around trying to thug, wearing the hats, twisted like the world because they're trying to be like the world. I'll joke around sometimes, take a picture with my hat crooked. But I already know who I am. I know I'm connected to Jesus Christ 
the living word. And, and that's not my DNA. That's not my nature. I joke around and play around in a minute. But when it comes to being serious about the things of God, I shut the devil down in a minute because I ain't got time to be playing in his pig pen anymore. And you got too many people that have, have not matured in the things of God. They're still babies in the, in the, in the, in the kingdom of God. And the Bible says he that has no, he, he that has no, no skills in the word of God, it's like a baby still designed to sense of the word. If you haven't been teaching and studying and learning the word of God, you're still a baby. You can be 50 years old and still a baby in the kingdom of God because you never desired. Check what I'm about to say here. Many people in the body of Christ are still immature because they never desired to grow up. They became comfortable with just the invitation to receive Christ as Lord and Savior, and that's good enough. You're lacking the benefits. You're lacking the fruit of the benefits of the kingdom of God. You're lacking the prosperity of the kingdom of God. You're lacking the mind of the, of the spirit of God because everything God has for you is going to accelerate you to a higher level in Christ, even to a dimension higher than you went before in the things of God to perfect the things that concern you. I guarantee when you desire to mature in the things of God, the Holy Spirit will begin to teach you. Along with, the, with all other bad attitudes we have already seen in the previous scriptures, in this passage we see evidence that in Israelites of a tremendous lack of gratitude, the children of Israel simply could not quit thinking about where they had come from and where they, had long been, and where they were long enough to get where they were going. The children of Israel simply could not stop thinking about where they had come from and where they were long enough to get where they were going. In other words, it's taking too long. It would have, been, it would have helped them to consider their forefather Abraham. He went through some disappointing experiences in his life, but he did not allow them to negatively negatively affect his future. That is a very vital point as a believer, as a child of God. Don't allow your past mistakes, your failures, your shortcomings, other folk in your life that disappointed you to prevent you from seeing yourself in the future that God has for you. Don't allow yourself to get into a negative mindset that would affect you from entering to the future promise that God has for your life. No life was strife. No life was strife. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abraham cattle and the herdsmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanites and the Perizzites were dwelling then in the land, making fodder more difficult to obtain. No, they were opposing him, coming against them. And Abraham said to Lot, Let there be no strife, I beg you, between you and me, or between your herdsmen and my herdsmen, for we are relatives. So they were fighting about territory. If you read the story, you find out it was a dissension between uh, Abraham and Lot's herdsmen because of territory. It is not, so is it not the whole land before you? Separate yourself, I beg you, from me. If you take the left, then I'll go to the right. If you choose the right hand, then I'll go to the left. God promised Abraham a land flowing with milk and honey. Then he said, out of his, his, his loins shall all the kings of the world be blessed. So God said, you're going to be father of many nations. So you're going to be so blessed that everywhere you go, the blessing is going to continue to flow through your lineage to the next generation, the next generation, next generation. So here you find Abraham and Lot just coming out of, 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 of Sodom and Gomorrah. They're going to the place where God has promised them another land. So they're going to this land, and in this land, it's so big, but yet they're fighting for territory. So Abraham said, you know what, Lot? We're a family. Let's not fight over this land. Matter of fact, if you go to the left, then I'll, I'll take the land on the right. If you, if you go to, to the right, I'll take the land on the left. And it, so in other words, he said, you know what? 
I'm willing to, to give you what you want to make you happy. Isn't that what God does for us? He does the very same thing in our lives. He do what we want when our ways are pleasing to the Lord. He would give you the desires of your heart. But you have to be willing to give up yourself for the cause of Christ. And Lot looked and saw everywhere the Jordan Valley was well watered before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. It was all, it was all like a garden of the, of the Lord and like the land of Egypt as you, as you go to Zoar. Then Lot chose for himself the Jordan Valley and he traveled east and they, so they separated. And this is Genesis chapter 13, verse 7 through 11. So they decided to depart and go to a different place, their different ways to different places. Abraham knew the danger of living in strife. Therefore, he told a lot they needed to separate in order to walk in love and ensure that there was no strife between them in the future. Abraham allowed his nephew to choose which valley he wanted first. Lot chose the best one the Jordan Valley, and they separated. We must remember that Lot had nothing until Abraham blessed him. Lot had nothing until Abraham blessed him. Think of an attitude that Abraham could have had. He could have, he could have chose not to. He knew that if he acted properly, God would take care of him. And that is so awesome to know that even when it comes to making decisions between someone else, and you wouldn't say, okay, you know what? I'm going to give you the best that I have. I'm going to take the lesser, lesser blessing. So what I get blessed with, I'm going to give you the best part of the blessing. And I'll take the lesser one. And because the attitude is right with God, God gives you double for your trouble. He, he, he double, he give you more blessings than you had in the beginning because your attitude was right before God to give someone else the best that you had to offer. And that's what God looks for us today out of our life to give him the best that we have to offer before him. The Lord said to Abraham, and the lot had left him, lift up now your eyes and look to the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land which you see, I will give to you and to your prosperity forever. Your posterity. That means everything that you want because your posture is in the right place with God your attitude is in the right place with God. Your character in the right place with God. God says, because you gave Lot the best land, I'm going to give you everything that you wanted and desired. That's the God we serve. This passage clearly reveals that even though Abraham found himself in less desirable circumstances after separating from his nephew, God wanted him to look up from the place where he was to the place that he wanted to take him. That is so awesome. Because our attitudes, when we get into the right place with God, God wants us to look up, not look down. So lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up your everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. God promises, I will come into your life. I will bless you with everything you need me to do when your attitude is right with me. That's the God we serve. Abraham had a good attitude about this situation. And as a result, the devil could not keep the blessing from, of God from him. Because his attitude was right with God, the devil could not prevent the promises of God in his life. God gave him more, even more possessions than he had enjoyed before the separation and blessed him mightily in every way. That is so awesome to know that God blessed Abraham in a mighty way. Because his attitude was right to give the best he had to his nephew, God gave him even more than what he had in the beginning, what he promised him. I encourage you to take a positive look at the possibilities of the future and begin to call those things which be not as though they were. Romans chapter 4, verse 17. Think and, th think and speak about your future in a positive way, according to what God has placed in your heart not according to what you have seen in the past or are seen even now in your presence. In other words, don't let your past hinder you 
from receiving the blessings of the future that God has for your life. Don't allow your past to dictate to you what your future is going to be. The same way God blessed Abraham with more than enough, we have the same ability and the same power from the word of God to speak things to our lives by our obedience to the voice of the Holy Spirit to say what God says about our situation. Your situation may be dark and gloom right now, but I guarantee you, when you turn your focus from your situation and begin to focus on the Lord, the Lord's going to show up in your situation. He's going to give you peace. He's going to give you joy. He's going to bless you, show you favor, open doors in your life, cause men to give into your bosom. As God promises that every blessing God has for you, his promises is yes and amen. So all God's promises for every believer is yes and amen. That means so be it. It's already done. Whatever you need God to do in your life tonight, I encourage you to find your favorite scripture in the Bible. Begin to read that scripture. Meditate on that scripture. Even pray that scripture over your situation. I love Psalm 91 and 1. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. That's a guarantee. Even when my situation may look like I'm in a dark place, God promises me that I can rest, I can settle, I can abide in his presence under his security. He'll take care of me. He'll cause things to work out in my favor as I trust him in his word and keep standing and believing that God has the power and the ability to turn my life around and my circumstance and cause the work in my favor. That's the God we serve. So I pray tonight that something has been said that would encourage you, that would motivate you, that even challenge you to get into the Word of God. Begin to read the Word of God. Meditate on the Word of God. Speak the Word of God to yourself, to your family, to your children, over your situation, over circumstances, over your health, over your mindset. Allow the Holy Spirit to change your thought life that you become more conducive and fashioned in the image and the likeness of God and allow him to change your entire life for the better. And I guarantee when you do that, the Holy Spirit takes control. Not only does he take control, but he leads you in a pathway of prosperity. He leads you in a pathway where the blessing, the favor of God will begin to fall on your life. And everything you need God to do you'll begin to see it manifest in your life in this season. So, Lord God, tonight I thank you for your word. I pray your word has not fallen from deaf ears, but your word shall bring a change in the hearts of all who heard this word tonight, O oh God, and provoke us to righteousness. Purify our thoughts tonight, O oh God. Forgive us for the times we failed to trust you and allowed our past to dictate what our future is going to be. We ask that you take away the negative thinking and give us the positive thinking of the Spirit. Begin to think according to the Word of God, what you said in your Word about us, that I'm blessed and highly favored God, that I'm blessed coming in and blessed going out, that everything I touch will be blessed because you deemed it to be so in my life. Forgive us for our sins to now, God, knowingly, unknowingly. Wash us in the blood of the Lamb and begin to come into our hearts and be our Lord and Savior. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I thank you again for tuning in tonight to the Bible class. I pray that you stay in the Word of God. Allow the Lord to seal the breach in your mind of negativity, of failure, of unbelief. Whatever it is in your heart that's not of God, allow the Holy Spirit to reveal it to you. Even when you pray tonight, ask the Lord to reveal to you if there's something in your heart that you know that should not be there, even the things that you're not mindful of, reveal it. And to take it out and to purify my thoughts and my actions by the blood of the Lamb. And I guarantee you, when God begins to expose these things in your life, you strip the enemy 
of the power of influence in your mindset. You strip the enemy of his mind binding control of his spirit in your mindset. And then you begin to gravitate, draw to the mind of Christ, have the attitude of Christ, and everything about you will begin to change to where you become more fruitful, more abundant, more stronger, more powerful against the thought life of the enemy, even his negative, foul spirit and demonic imps that would come, come into your life to tempt you to, to fall into a place of lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Until next week, the Lord says the same. You stay encouraged and know that Jesus loves you, and so do I. Feel free to share this video with somebody else that you think they may need to hear this word and allow this word to change their life and their thought life in your life as you continue to rehearse this thing. Play it again. Allow the Lord to really minister to your heart. And I guarantee when he does, you're going to find yourself changing your life, your attitude, everything about you will begin to change, become more and more like Christ as you walk by faith and not by sight. You all have a good night. And may the Lord bless you. May the Lord watch between you, me and thee while we absent one from another until we meet again. In Jesus' name, amen. Shalom.